In this lecture, we're going to look at the fossil history of the human lineage and various aspects of evolutionary change in modern humans. We've been surveying a broad number of topics on the diversity of life. We're still thinking about complexity in a complex world. We've looked at vertebrate evolution. Now we're looking at human origins. We've seen various evolutionary innovations from moving into very broad habitats, from the oceans to fresh water, onto land, dry land, etc. We're in the middle now of contemplating the consequences of living in a three-dimensional habitat, particularly in its effects on brain size. So as we go through each one of these fossil species, I'll point out their relative brain size, but I'll also give you a few interesting facts about their basic biology. So the first species I want to show you is called Tumai. Its Latin name is Sahelanthropus, and it's found in the African country of Chad in the region called the Sahel, which is sort of a sub-desert area. So this is the modern habitat, but back in the day that was very different. And the Sahel was very different climate in those days. And this species is now considered to be the last common ancestor of chimps and humans from about 6.4 million years ago. This is an animal that would have had access to a lot of forest and climbed the trees a lot. But look at the size of their brain. It's about 325 cc's. A chimpanzee has a brain that's about 350 cc's. Now from this, we're going to see a lot of other fossils. We're going to look at a very number of these. The next one I want you to see is Ardipithecus, Ardipithecus ramidus. This dates from about 4 million years ago. And Ardipithecus, again, has a very small brain, only about 325 cc's. Dates from 4.4 million years ago. It was about four feet tall. Now they have very long arms, short legs, and flat feet. Now the shape of their pelvis tells us they could walk upright, but they were much more agile climbing trees. So these were animals that were much more comfortable in the trees than they were on the ground, even though they could walk on their back legs. Now here we have down below another time scale. So here's Ardipithecus at about 4.4 million years ago. And we're now going to go forward in time to Australopithecus. And Australopithecus is from 4 million years up to about 2 million years ago. Australopithecus includes one of the most famous fossils ever discovered, an individual uh, found in Ethiopia named Lucy. Uh, she died about 3.2 million years ago. And the key thing about Lucy is she's got somewhat larger brain now, 475 cc's as opposed to only 325 cc's. And that's not bad. I mean, she's only three feet tall. So a very small animal with a pretty good sized brain compared to a chimp. But one of the things that's most interesting to the anthropologists about Lucy has always been the fact that she clearly walked, mostly. This is a bipedal animal. These are fossils from Tanzania, a couple of countries to the south of Ethiopia, that were made uh, in volcanic ash uh, shortly before uh, a slight rain that preserved the ash. And here's the footsteps of Australopithecus. This is an adult and a child walking side by side. So Lucy's pelvis tells us that her limb bones fell straight below, and so she could swing her legs like pendulums, whereas the chimp's legs come out at an angle, and they'd have to kind of arch around like this to walk. So Lucy really was an animal that could walk almost like modern humans. Furthermore, Lucy used tools and ate meat. We have from the fossils of these species there are animal bones found in their living quarters. So we know that they ate the meat, and not only that, but they butchered them. So they used stones to, to strike off uh, scraps of meat from the bones. And this dates from about 3.4 million years ago. So this is the only hominid at the time. And so this is the species that we would now say shows the first signs of methodically using tools in preparing animal protein. Okay. So then from Australopithecus, we reach now genus Homo. And that eventually is going to reach us up to Homo sapiens. But we've got a number of species to look at before we get there. 
So here's a family tree of the hominids from Lucy species, Australopithecus afarensis onwards. And amongst these, we have Paranthropus, which lived for over a million years, still has a moderate-sized brain like Lucy, about 470 cc's, still quite ape-like in comparison to other species that came later. Then we have Homo habilis. And this is the first species that's been designated in the genus Homo, and it's characterized by a much bigger brain, 670 cc's compared to 470 of Paranthropus and Australopithecus. Then we have Homo ergaster with 800 cc's, and so we see a trend for much, much larger brains. So what do we know about brain size, and how can we put that into a context that allows us to make comparisons across different species. The most common way of doing this is to plot brain size compared to a species body weight. So this axis along here gives an animal's overall body weight. And we're going to put this on a logarithmic scale going from really small animals out to really big ones. So a thousand kilos, you're getting up to the size of a big cow or a buffalo or something. And then up here is the size of the brain. And so we know that very small animals absolutely have to have small brains. and Very big things should have to have fairly big brains to run the machinery of a much bigger body. So we expect there to be some sort of relationship between brain size and body size. But what's interesting about evolutionary change in brain size is as we went from the fish to the amphibia to the reptiles, we saw them change their lifestyle. They grew limbs, they grew waterproof skin, but their brains never got any bigger. So a reptile, pound for pound, is no smarter than a fish. But when we got to the mammals, even in the earliest fossil mammals, for a given body size, they have a brain that's larger than that for a reptile or an amphibian. And then through evolutionary time, mammalian brains have gotten bigger for their body size. So it's as if there's been selection favoring greater intelligence in all the mammalian species. Now, amongst the mammals, the primates have even larger brains for their body size. So monkeys, which may only be this big, have a brain that's far bigger for its body size than a squirrel, okay? So for a given body size, our ancestors, whether they were first mammals and then primates have always been in the lineage with the largest brains. As we get more recent, as we go from Australopithecus to Homo habilis to Homo ergaster to Homo etc. up to us, we see that brain size rapidly gets larger. So here we have the Lucy type hominids with a brain that's only about 400 to 450 cc's. Homo habilis is about 600 cc's, that's here. Homo ergaster is about 800, but then we get more modern species and the brain really picks up. And modern species have a brain that's nearly 1,800 cc's, four times bigger than that of, a, of Lucy. So if we look at the machinery of what governs the growth of different organs in our bodies, we're going to be looking at proximal mechanisms. And to think about human evolution in contrast with other primates, we want to focus on what happens in the growth of our brains compared to those of other primates. So we've already seen that regulatory genes control how much RNA is transcribed and thus the extent of protein synthesis. And the amount of protein then is going to be laid down in the actual building blocks in the development of our organs. This rather complicated graph is going to contrast the gene expression of a series of different genes that are influencing uh, the brain growth in four different primate species. So each one of these graphs is contrasting the gene expression of these different genes down here. And the initial here, H, stands for human, and then C, chimp, O, orang, and M, and macaque. So macaques, monkeys, chimps, orangs, great apes, they have the same genes that have these funny names that we won't need to remember, like LGALS4 and TIMP3, etc. They have homologs for those, but 
they're producing more or less gene product than our equivalent gene does. So these on the left-hand panel here are five different genes where the humans are expressing a lot more ultimately of the, of the RNA and then ultimately of protein than chimps, orangs, or macaques, particularly in this one. So we have far more protein being produced at this locus, quite a bit more here, here, and here. And then there are other loci that we've pretty much turned off. So chimp, orang, and macaques during their development are producing a lot of proteins at these five loci, whereas ours are qu relatively quiet. So we have these regulatory genes that are controlling how much protein is being produced. We can grow a lot more that will end up in the architecture of our very complex brains than the other species. So those are mechanistic explanations for why our brains are different. That tells us that certain genes are being turned on or turned off and they help to produce these very large brains. But what would select for that pattern? What we now want to look at are the ecological factors that are associated with the evolution of large brain size. First is, as I've implied with the title of this section, a complex environment. If we look at the habitat of relatively closely related species, we find that it does make a difference in how big their brains are. So that here we have two rodents that are about the same size, a squirrel and a gopher. The squirrel climbs trees, the gopher lives in the ground, it burrows, it lives on a flat surface. The squirrel, if it has to escape a predator, has to realize, ah, I'm going to somehow navigate on that branch, go across that twig over there, leap down there. It's a very complex chore. Even just to get to a good food site, it has to say, okay, how am I going to navigate through this complex world? So squirrels, for their body size, have much larger brains than do gophers. Also, the distribution of food can influence how large a species' brains may grow. So, of these New World monkeys, there are frugivorous monkeys, that is, they eat fruit, these spider monkeys, and they have to figure out, well, let's see, those are some really nice fruits over there, and then I have to climb the tree to do that, and oh, also, I remember that last year the fruit crop came in about April, what's going on? So there's a lot that is involved in processing, finding their food efficiently, whereas with folivorous howler monkeys, fairly closely related to the spider monkeys, but they eat leaves, and a leaf is a leaf is a leaf. And a howler monkey could wake up in the morning and say, well, I guess I'll eat another leaf. Oh, there's another leaf. There's a, not a lot of thought involved in finding the next meal. So these fruit-eating species are much larger brain than the leaf eaters. Then food also have an influence on how important it is to have a good memory. So there are some species that store food. So pinyon jays, for example, are amazing in that they will collect the nuts of the pinyon pine at the time of the harvest. So there's abundance of food. They can't possibly eat it all. But then they're going to face an incredible shortage of food once winter comes and there's no more crop. So they take the surplus that's available in the fall and they go and they hide it because they don't want to lose it to other seed eaters. They hide it so nobody else can find it and then they remember where they put it. And so they come back and they have incredible memory. They can remember where they've hidden the nut two, three months later. Closely related to the pinyon jays are tailor birds and they don't have a good memory at all. So these are much larger brained than are the tailor birds. And then, even though our gophers may not be as smart as squirrels, we do have some fairly smart chickadees up here. Chickadees live in a much harsher climate than the chickadees down in Kansas. So Minnesota chickadees have to be able to survive this long winter. They have to be very cunning in figuring out how to find enough to eat to get through that harsh time, whereas it's relatively mild and easy to get through the winter in Kansas. And so chickadees in Minnesota have larger brains than their counterparts south of here in Kansas. So I've made the case that any animal, not just humans, but any other animal, can be selected to have much greater intelligence, as reflected ultimately in having a larger brain.
But how smart are these animals really? Well, let's look at an incredible species, the Caledonian crow. These live in New Zealand, and they're really quite remarkable animals. They like to use tools a lot in the processing of their food. And so they'll pick a twig, and then they use it as a probe, and they'll poke it into crevices and try to spear grubs, pull them out, and then they can eat them. And so we know that in nature, they are avid tool users. So these are tools made by crows that have been found in nature. But brought into the lab, this is where people have discovered how incredibly smart these animals are. And I want to show you a little video now of a famous Caledonian crow who lives now in Oxford in a psychology laboratory who's been given a number of challenges on how to get enough to eat. Her name is Betty. So we'll watch Betty here. So Betty has been given a task to get the food out of this tube, which is in a little bale, and the bale has a handle on it. And she found a piece of wire, and she immediately starts using it to poke on the handle of the bale, just like she would in nature to poke out a grub. But it's not working for her, so she then manipulates the wire. This is the first time she's ever been given this challenge. She realizes that if she turns it into a hook, it'll work out for her. So she pulls out the bale and gets her food. That's incredible, isn't it? I mean, that's so cool that I think everybody should watch that twice. <laughs> Here she is, she's got the straight wire. She's only ever played with straight wires before. It's not working to pull. She's used to poking things, not pulling. And that's extraordinary. That's just incredible. Good for Betty. Okay, so we've now got a large brain animal living in a complex habitat. And once we have this much intelligence, solving problems can happen not just by instinct, not being hardwired to behave in a certain way, but with a reliance on culture. Culture is defined as the ability to pass on behavior through social learning. Somebody else has figured out how to solve a problem. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can copy what they do. So you learn socially from their behavior. And this is something that's a characteristic, we think, of mammals as opposed to other species because of the physiology of maternal care. Mammals are defined by the fact that females secrete milk. They have relatively well-developed offspring who then stay with and nurse from them from quite a period of time as there's many opportunities for the offspring to learn from the mother's behavior. So here's our relative brain size now. We said that absolutely larger species would have absolutely larger brain, but for a given body size, some species have really much larger brains than others, like the primates do compared to other mammals. And so this now on the y-axis here says you have relatively smart animals, so they have a brain that may be two or three times as high as you'd predict on that overall trend of brain size to body size. And these do indeed include primates, Ateles, those are spider monkeys, Seguinus, these are uh, squirrel monkeys, so these are primates. And things that are kind of dumb for their body size, these are possums, and a rhino is not very smart either. Now, what's interesting about this is that you have this much greater relative brain size in species that spend a long time with their mom. Primates are characterized by a very prolonged relationship between mother and offspring, which gives the offspring many opportunities to learn new skills from its mom. And this has really been well studied in our closest living relative, chimpanzees. Here we have a population of chimps in West Africa, and they're well known for using tools in a novel way. This is only seen in a few populations in West Africa that they collect nuts that are very difficult for them to crack open with their teeth. They carry them to an area that has really 
strong, large, flat rocks like anvils. And then they put the nut on the anvil and they pick up another rock and they break it and they smash it. Now their offspring are watching them as they do this. And as they mature, these offspring develop these same complex behaviors as their parents. Now, a really fun study along this was done actually here at the University of Minnesota by a graduate student over in the Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior Department a few years ago. Uh, she was working on chimpanzees in East Africa, the same place where Jane Goodall does her chimp studies. And this is a place where the chimps don't use rocks to crack open nuts, but they have a culture around fishing for termites. So they go to a termite mound, they pull off a twig, either of grass or of a tree, they poke it inside, and that disturbs the termites, and you have the soldiers who get all upset at an invasion in their colony, they bite onto the twig, the chimp pulls it out, all these warriors are, are stuck onto it, and they suck them off. Okay, so it's a good meal of animal protein for the chimps who use the tools. I want to show you, though, is how this trait is acquired. So here's a mother with her offspring. So she's poking around. There's the mother poking around, pulling out the soldiers that have attached to the stick. And there you can see the kids are vaguely paying attention, okay, as she does so. Now one of the things about this tool use is that each female has a characteristic length of tool that she will prepare in advance and insert into the opening in the termite mound. And she also has a characteristic material that she uses to make these tools from. So what's interesting about this study was seeing how the offspring developed a similar, similar or different preference for a certain kind of tool for their termite fishing. Now these graphs show various aspects of this tool use behavior by the young chimpanzees. And I don't want to start there, I want to start in the middle one. And this shows how the daughter's behavior is very close to the behavior of the mom. So some mothers would have very large tools, very long tools that they would use. Other mothers had very short tools, okay? And so those females that typically used short tools, their daughters also had short tools. Mothers who had moderate-sized tools, the daughters like to use moderate-sized tools. The mothers with large tools, the daughters likewise had large tools. So they seem to be paying attention. The daughters are at the termite mound, and it's like they're in class. Mom's the teacher, and they're paying close attention, okay? Now, what's fascinating here is the son's behavior, because the son didn't pay any attention to what mom was doing, okay? And so the mom may have different length tools, but sons didn't show any relationship in their behavior to what the mother was doing. So the, the sons are there, they're stuck with their mom all day, but they're wandering around paying no particular attention to what she's doing. What's fascinating in some ways about this, for those of you who want to contemplate life in your own family with a brother or sister, or a boyfriend or girlfriend, is that whereas the little girl chimpanzees, because they were playing close, paying close attention to their moms, they quickly got very adept at fishing for termites. And so the amount of time they spent termite fishing grew really rapidly when they're only about three years old. Those are pretty small chimps at that stage. Whereas the males at that age were hopeless, okay? But eventually, the males, despite not paying any attention to their moms whatsoever, would kind of just bash around and at random decide something that they liked to do that suited them. And by the time they were about seven, eight, or nine, they'd caught up with the girls and they were just as good at termite fishing as were the females.